Is the movement of the body a kind of poetics? The way the heart wells at its own triggers, the way the spirit moves as the eye traces sea water, is the lengthening of the stride, the voice of desire, walking to itself, the scream a capitalization, the shudder is punctuation. And if I were to turn to you, whisper in a sigh into your ear, shall we call that a parenthesis, an escape from the main conversation, the bracket of my hands, the momentary secret world, your head turned towards mine as the clothes. How many metaphors have our elbows made? If I place it on this table, beside you, where you could reach for it, is that a clue? The brush of a hand is the epitome of literary suspense, the suggestion of the neck, the turning point, the crossing of legs, a bathos. And what about silence, the calm of unsaid things, the nothingness expressed the same way in both body and text, a negation, a lack, the arm moving along the shape of a ghost, the pen writing around the fact of unspoken trauma, the word failing the body, the body failing vocabulary, a poem without meaning except in its reach for materiality. Welcome to the first edition of an Ekfrastic series, a recurring series of programs that invites writers and poets in Singapore to take viewers through a personal tour of an exhibition found within the National Gallery of Singapore. I'm Diana Rahim, a writer, editor of Beyond the Hijab, and a photographer under the moniker of Verka. For this edition, I'll be reflecting on the artworks found in Chuasu Bin's Truth and Legends. I'm happy to do it today to talk to you about Art of All Things, as we are going through a global crisis in the form of a pandemic, when our basic and immediate needs are the ones that take center stage in our minds, it can feel as if the things that give us pleasure, like art, are luxuries we cannot afford. And in a sense, they are. But it is in a time like this when I really believe that these pleasures, these rare luxuries, are necessary for us to keep in touch with our own humanity and the humanity of others. So I'm glad to see their artistic programs continue to reach audiences online and I'm happy to participate in one myself. I read my poem Body Language because of the way it pays attention to the, how the body is read. In some ways, I feel like that relates to how we interpret images of people as well. In trying to understand them, we always reach for the certainty and the shape of language. These themes, amongst others, are what I wish to address and share with you as I reflect on the photographs of Chua Su Bin and I will then give a creative writing prompt at the end of the program and invite everyone watching an opportunity to craft your own poems inspired by the Chua Su Bin exhibition. Singaporean photographer Chua Su Bin is renowned as a photographer, art director, art dealer and patron. Chua Subin, Truth and Legends, pays tribute to Chua's significant body of photographic work as well as the many ways he has contributed to the art scene in Singapore. Here we see his self-portrait that reflects his professionalism, experience and stature within the industry. It's a perfectly framed and perfectly taken photograph. As a photographer, your self-portrait is your flex, so to speak. It's such a definitive image of you and your style on your own terms. Look through any self-portrait of a photographer and you see their personality. The self-portraits of the late American photographer Diane Arbus are quiet and contemplative. The self-portraits of Japanese artists Araki are eccentric, while the self-portraits of Daigo Moriyama are avant-garde, highly con contrasted and even queer. I've only ever taken one self-portrait of myself, and because I'm not as professional as Charles Lubin, it shows. My lights were normal lamp lights that were adjusted to light my left side and the curtains behind me. And I'm not as interested to show my cheap though dependable medium format film camera in a mirror shot um, or to relate an image of professionalism. I'm more interested in how I like to frame portraits in a more staged way as per my style. This photograph isn't a portrait of me but one I took of a friend instead. Clearly, me and Chua Subin have such different styles. I very rarely shoot in black and white for a start, and I have little interest in Chinese ink paintings. Though we do both shoot with film despite being decades apart in age. 
But as I look through his collection, I do see the motivation that a segment of photographers have in common, which is to capture people in some essential, unguarded way. I share this motivation too because I do think it leads to the best pictures. The pictures I've selected for us to look at later are those that I feel reflect this motivation. Today we look at Legends, a series that Chua shot in his 50s after decades of working as a photographer. Chua noticed the lack of photographic documentation of Chinese ink masters whose work he admired greatly. The Chinese title of Legends is Liu Chen, which translates to the truth that is left. The title in both languages point to the passage of time, to time that has passed. These are reflective pieces of people who have already established themselves as masters of their craft. It is probably significant that Chua Subin himself was already in his 50s when he shot this series and that the artists were all over 75 years of age because this would understandably impact how he had conceptualized and approached the subject matter. The reflective nature can be seen, for example, in this photo of Wang Junpi. Chua Subin had decided to photograph his ink master engaging in his daily morning exercises in his garden. Wang Junbi is regarded as a master in Chinese landscape painting. It was probably deliberate of Subin to photograph Wang Junbi surrounded by elements of the natural world, with plants and even a birdcage in the background. Not many other portraits of, of the masters possess this framing. In order to capture a photograph like this of Liu Haisu, I can imagine that Chua Subin had to do the work unrelated to the technicality of photography. He had to express a deep interest in his subjects and for them to trust him enough. This series is about ink masters, but the photos, such as this one, rarely show them actively working or painting. Instead, what is depicted is the individual personality of these artists and the intimate moments of them being human, of them being situated outside of their work. To capture someone outside of work in a moment of rest always makes for an intriguing picture. I myself have always loved capturing such moments. In part, I think it is because humans are always, and increasingly so, defined by our work and our productivity. Capture a person at work and you're instantly capturing an almost ideological picture. It's dynamic, it's full of movement, and the person is easy to understand in that image. They are working. Their whole identity collapses into their work, because that is what is shown. But photograph someone at rest, milling, not at work, and you're showing a human being as being, as someone just existing. That is why it's so calming to look at Chua Subin's photographs, and why his photographs are so intriguing. Capture someone at work, and you're capturing something almost uncomplicated, an image other people might see of the other person doing every day. Capture someone at rest, and you capture something far more intimate and rare. It's an image the photographer has to be invited to, or be lucky enough to capture. Take this photo of Chao Xiaoang, for example. Chua photographs the master breathing into his instinct, a particular idiosyncrasy of the painter. Chao Xiaoang was a second generation master of the Lingnan School of Painting, a movement associated with the modernization of Chinese painting. Here too, we see the capturing of an everyday banality. But why this moment, I want to ask? Why this idiosyncrasy? Is it representative of an individual with the proclivity to modernize? Time is a fundamental element of photography, the freezing of one moment. The photographer always chooses to isolate and omit everything else that is unnecessary to them. A photograph is proof of visual sacrifice of what has been omitted. It is also proof of visual, ven of visual veneration of what has been prioritized to be shown. That is why so much effective propaganda is visual in a way. It's because of the isolating nature of the image. Let's take a moment here to look at this intriguing portrait of Chinese cartoonist and figurative painter Ye Chien Yu. What would you make of the brushes in the foreground? What do they look like to you? How would your understanding of this portrait change 
If I told you that Ye Chen Yu was forced to move out of his home due to land redevelopment and that he decided to stop painting as a form of protest, is it possible to say that Chua Su Bin's decision to photograph the artist in this way nods to his decision to hang up his brush? Compared to his other photographs, this one is more conceptual in nature. You can tell Chua Su Bin is trying to communicate not an intimate moment of rest, but an image that instead represents Ye Chen Yu's decision to protest. Chua Su Bin basically attempted an artistic interpretation of this moment. What we are seeing here reminds me of how Takuma Nakahira had summarized jean Lok Godard's definition of an image as the second reality that has been transformed and made subjective by the photographer's confrontation with it. The photograph further exemplifies how photography is not just about the isolation of time, but how what is included within the frame is also dependent on what has been omitted from the frame. According to John Berger, a photograph functions in the inverse way that a painting does. Everything we do not see lends weight to how the photograph is read. If we did not know Ye Chen Yu's history, for example, it would have been impossible to appreciate this photograph as meaningfully. As an alternative example, we can look to this ink painting by Wu Guanzhong, one of the ink masters photographed by Chua Su Bin, whose painting, The Sea Too, also hangs besides his portraits within the exhibition. Everything we have to say about this painting lies within the frame. This painting is about its complex composition, its mixture of brush strokes and ink tones, and the way these strokes mirror the liveliness of what happens under the sea. So the gaze we have with paintings and the gaze we have with photographs is very different. In the spirit of time, the fundamental element of photography, allow me now to read to you a poem of mine that considers what happens when it runs out in this life and how this passage of time can make the meaning of everything change. Life after death. Not being able to choose in the beginning if we wanted to be born, we might be distraught to realize we were unable to choose for the second time. But maybe by then, there will be no such thing as anger or sadness. Just as you possess no body and therefore throw no shadow, perhaps the absence of death makes sentiment impossible. Remembering your corporeal life may only bring a belated knowing. Your losses ultimately did not matter. There was no use in letting your griefs overstay or believing that happiness was desired. Looking back at the death was the same as looking back at the memory of water. Still, your wisdom also means you know this knowledge means nothing. At least in the first life, there was no uselessness in the little beauties. Your lover's name in your mouth felt like the deepest sleep. And in that feeling, you justified your whole life and even the life to come. On that note, let us look at this portrait that Chua took of Liu Kang, a first-generation Singaporean artist known for his contributions to the Nanyang School of Painting as a way to see how time might also function in photography. This candid image was taken in Liu Kang's home a year before his passing. He's having a private moment with his wife, Jen Pen. To have seen this photograph a month after it was taken must have been far different than to have seen it just after Liu Kang passed away. All the same, it must be different for viewers to have seen the series Legends when the masters were still alive and it is for us to now see the photographs after all of them have passed on. Similarly, a photograph is a slice of time and it's a slice of meaning that can shift continually as more time passes. That is its magic, and I hope in our session today, I was able to communicate this wonder in photography with you. We are approaching the end now, but I want to ask you to engage in an ekphrastic practice with me. We look now, finally, to the portrait of Wu Guan Chong. 
Unlike many other portraits in this series, he is working. It's an anomalous image in the series, but it's significant because this is the first time in four decades that the artist has managed to paint a human figure after being forced to abandon the subject during the Cultural Revolution. I want to ask you to try and write a poem based on this photograph. What do you think he is feeling or thinking as he is painting this picture? What is it like to paint a body again after four decades of being prohibited from doing so? How would it feel to draw a face, a foot, a belly again for the first time in so long? One way you could consider framing your poem is to think of the sequence the painting might take. Or rather, how a body would appear on the canvas, one part at a time. For example, your first line could be, The first thing I draw is the neck, the feet, it's up to you. Another approach to consider for your poem is to think about how differently a body would mean to you now. The poem I read in the beginning of this session had compared the movement of the body to aspects of language. Consider writing a poem that compares the body to aspects of a photograph. How would you photograph a body and how would you describe your choices in your poem? Which parts would you want to be highly contrasted? Which parts hidden and which parts would be the main focus? Hi, my name is Maisara Kamil. This is my first time writing a poem based on an artwork and it was definitely not easy. I tried to imagine myself as the artist, processing the thoughts that come through my mind as I stared at a painting. This is my poem, titled Abstraction. An empty canvas, where do I begin? A story yet to be told. An unclothed human body in its rawest form. What does it symbolize? Femininity and masculinity, men and women. When softness is seen as weakness, when machismo is seen as strength, what is gender equality? Hello, my name is Vanessa. As a first timer to poems, I feel quite satisfied in the result. At the beginning, it was difficult as I did not know what to write. But as I look at Chua Shu Bin's photograph and imagine myself as Wu Guangzhong, ideas begin to flow through. I imagine myself having to start afresh in the things I love to do after a tragedy befell on me. It was miserable not being able to do what I love for a period of time. Four decades like Wu Guangzhong. Yet, restarting what I love again poses difficulties as well. I could feel the blackness he felt at that point of time as he tries to start painting again. As we grow older, our memory worsens and a new set of problems arises. By overcoming all these obstacles and taking the road less traveled, I'm glad that he persevered and achieved his dreams. Here goes my poem. Starting afresh. Nervous and anxious is what I feel as I begin painting. Beginning with sketches, I felt like I was at an age. After all, it has been four decades. My skills would have faded. I'm slowly picking up myself once again while not being constrained. Slowly, head, shoulders, knees and toes. Finally, I was able to paint what I desired. Hello, my name is Justina. So, um, it was really difficult for me at first to come up with this uh, poem because uh, I have no experience at all. So, it was quite struggling at first to come up with something like that. So, uh, so I remember I looked at the picture for quite a long time to come up with inspiration, but it will only come. It only come after I uh, read about the image history about how. Chua Shu Bin managed to take this photo at a point of time and the story behind it. So I put myself in Wu Kuang Shung's shoes at the time to imagine how and what he was thinking or even what will I be thinking at a point of time when I was drawing the painting the, uh, painting the photo. So uh, this is how the poem came about. So the title of the poem, uh, I named it Calm in the Chaos. So this is where the story goes. The first thing I draw is the head. What comes through her head is chaos. She was sitting there quietly with no emotions. Little did I know, she has chaos in her head. I go down her arms, trembling. I am not ready for her. 
I stand here, quietly painting the unseen, with all the voices in her head. Yep. Thank you. Thank you everyone for catching the first edition of an acrostic series. Do remember to share your creative writing responses via the hashtag gallery anywhere. My name is Diana Rahim and you can find my writings on Beyond the Hijab. Take care.